Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives. Jobs, debts, incomes, those we face, those coming down the road, and those confronting our children and the next generation. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I've been a professor of economics all my adult life with the hope that I can bring to bear what I've learned to make more sense out of the surrounding economic events than the most major media seem able to do. So let's jump right in. One of the most important documents of the last few weeks was a paper, a pamphlet actually, issued by Oxfam International. Oxfam is the most widely used and respected institution based in Great Britain that studies global inequality, has been doing it for years. In January of 2018, they issued a document entitled Reward Work, Not Wealth. Basically, it makes the case for exactly what its title says. But in so doing, it talks about the latest research it has either done or commissioned on global inequality, including the attitudes of people toward global inequality. So I want to bring you some of what they found, because it is crucial to understanding how the capitalist system that governs the world today, both in the so-called advanced part of the world and in the so-called less developed part, if you want to make an assessment of the capitalist system, take a look at its results. It's a logical way to proceed. So here are some of them. Last year, that's 2017, saw the biggest increase in the number of billionaires in history. One more billionaire was added to the list every two days. There are now, and this may come as a surprise to you, 2,043 billionaires in the world. Nine out of ten of them are men. These billionaires, these 2,043 individuals, in a population on this planet of 7 billion individuals, 2,000, that's point. Oh, 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 one percent of the population. Their wealth last year increased by a total of $762 billion. That is, the value of their stocks and bonds and land holdings went up by $762 billion. By every known calculation, of the number of people around the world living in extreme poverty, that amount of money is more than you need to eradicate extreme poverty on this planet. Let me drive this point home to you. The richest 2,043 people on the earth became richer over the last year by an amount of money larger than what would have been necessary to bring hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty, usually calculated as people living on less than $1.90 per day for food, clothing, shelter, and everything else. What kind of a society would be organized in such a way as to make the 2,043 richest people on the planet $762 billion richer when that's more than the money needed to eradicate extreme poverty for their fellow citizens, for their fellow human beings. This is a system that can't solve that problem, that makes the problem worse year after year. Meanwhile, some statistics I've given you in the past continue to be true and reaffirmed by Oxfam's research. The richest 1% on this planet own more wealth 
than the other 99% combined. The richest 1%, this happened in 2016, went over half. That is, the richest 1% own more than half. The other 99% fight over the remaining half. What Oxfam also did last year, and what I also want to report to you is, they interviewed, they surveyed 70,000 people in 10 countries. Population of those countries represent one quarter of the world's population. So they did this survey in countries that together account for a quarter of the people on this planet. Over three quarters of the people they surveyed either agree or strongly agree that the gap between rich and poor in their country is too large. The numbers range from 58% in the Netherlands, believe that, to 92% in Nigeria, believe that. Two-thirds of the respondents in the 10 countries think that the gap between rich and poor needs to be addressed urgently or very urgently. So what have we got? A wildly unequal distribution of wealth and income in the world and a vast majority of the people who are against it. And nonetheless, it gets worse, not better, with each passing year. What the majority thinks is unable in this culture and in this economy to be translated into corrective action. Overwhelming majorities want something which doesn't happen. The opposite happens, which means that those at the top no, not only have the wealth in their hands, but have bought the political system to make sure it isn't responsive to what the majority of people would want. This means that the consequences of capitalism are not only gross inequality, but also the political corruption that prevents that problem from being addressed even though the majority of people want it to be. In a peculiar way, much of the rest of today's economic updates will operate a little bit to illustrate what the summary that Oxfam has produced allowed me to just tell you about. So let's begin. Let me introduce to you the owner of a store you may have encountered, if not personally, well, through the internet. The store in question is called Victoria's Secret. It is a famous store that sells lingerie and all kinds of underwear and so forth. The owner is a billionaire, one of the 2043 I just told you about. His name is Leslie Wexner. W-E-X-N-E-R. He is 78 years of age, and he is worth, apparently, $7 billion. That is, he owns $7 billion worth of, well, I'm going to tell you about some of the things he owns, but I presume most of it is stocks and bonds, because that's what most of the wealthy hold most of their wealth in, those forms. But Mr. Wexner lives well. Perhaps most famous is a huge mansion in Britain. Mansions in Britain have their own name. This one is called Foxcote, F-O-X-C-O-T-E. Cost him apparently $30 million. It is referred to in the press as a gentleman's shooting estate. In October, helicopters came in, and apparently the shooting was done from the helicopter. What kind of sport you might want to call this, I leave to your judgment and your imagination. Mr. Wexner also owns a $47 million mansion outside of Columbus, Ohio. Likewise, one of the largest yachts ever built in the world, he owns it. In 1997, he got some more publicity when he paid $16.5 million dollars for a 1954 Ferrari automobile, but he's in litigation fighting with the former 
owner or the auction house that sold it to him, and so forth. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to understand that the people who are billionaires are only billionaires because the rest of us enable them to be billionaires. The people who go in and spend large amounts of money on the products of Victoria's Secret, when you buy that highly priced piece of clothing, you're feeding the billionaire Mr. Wexner. You're paying for that yacht and that mansion. Every time you shop there, and I don't mean to pick on Victoria's Secret, although I do get a bit of a kick out of it, because I could do the same thing with all the other billionaires, all of whom are in that position because you and I pay the money that flows into their pockets. You might think that if we pay the money, we would have some say about how that money is used, but not in a capitalist system. They can use it, and Mr. Wexner has done it in the way I've just summarized. My next economic update takes me once again to the issue of immigration. I don't mean to harp on it, but it is something that keeps being in the news. Why? Because Mr. Trump and the Republicans think they have a politically viable way to impress people. So now, let's do the numbers to see whether there's any truth in it. The population of the United States is 325 million people, roughly. So if we want to talk about the economic well-being of the American people, we're talking about the economic well-being, the job holders, who are roughly half of that population. How many undocumented immigrants are there? And those are the only ones that are being talked about when there's all this talk about stopping immigration or reversing immigration or expelling undocumented immigrants. Best guess of the United States government, 11.8 million. So let's be clear then, right? We're talking, when we talk about immigration, undocumented immigration, about 11, let's round it off, 12 million people in a population of 325 million people. Here's a hot flash for all of you. Nothing about that 11.8 million, no matter what happens to them or what is done to them, is going to fundamentally alter the economic situation of the American people. Lots of attention to expelling these 700,000 or closing off the border to these million. You're not talking about things that are going to change the pr problems of the American people, the economic problems. The whole focus on immigration is fake, is phony. It's a way to distract Americans from the economic problems they do have, serious ones, that affect tens of millions of families in this country that are not going to be affected one way or the other in any significant degree by anything that is done to the immigrants. So even if you are the kind of American who conveniently forgets that the whole country is a country of immigrants precisely because you wiped out the people who were here when the immigrants first came, and even if you're the kind of American who doesn't care about what it means to expel people at the bottom of the economic ladder who have already suffered from poverty and lack of education and poor housing and all the rest, and you want them to be the butt of your action to fix an economy, fixing it on the backs of those most already impoverished by it? If you don't have any moral problems with that, no ethical problems with that, here's the re argument, the reasoning an economist would give you. It's not the issue, friends. Jobs are the issue. Automation is the issue. Unequal distribution of wages and profits is the issue. Our whole capitalist system is the issue. Immigrants aren't the issue. It's as if you told me that the house was on fire 
and I told you, take a little nail file and try to work on a corner of the wood at the base of the house, you'd scream at me and say, that that's not going to solve the problem of a house on fire. We need a lot of water. We need other things. But uh, filing the corner of a piece of wood, you're crazy. My response as an economist to the discussion of immigration, to seeing Mr. Trump and the Republican leaders and the Democratic leaders arguing and fighting over the is to see a system whose job it is to distract the mass of people suffering from it from the system itself. Nobody's questioning the system. We're fighting over immigrants. It is a terrible misunderstanding of what's going on that makes all of that possible. Before I go on to other up to updates, let me remind you, as we always do, to make use of our websites, rdwolf with two Fs dot com and democracy at work, that's all one word, democracy at work dot info. Through those websites, you can communicate to us what you like and don't like about the program, what you would like us to cover. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can show us ways we can be more useful to you. For those of you that listen to this program as a radio program or as a podcast, let me remind you that you can also see it as a television program. The easiest way to do that, go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash economic update, and you can watch this program as a television program. These are all ways of partnering with us. Making us reach more people is something you can help us do and something we ask you to do as well as invite you to do. The websites are the key way to do that, and they're available to you at no charge ever, 24-7. Continuing on our story, after the tax cut bill was passed in December of last year, a great deal of noise was spent saying how this was, in the words of our president, a middle-class tax cut and so forth. I wanted to do some research to basically answer the question, is the tax cut that was passed by Mr. Trump and the Republicans something that will really transform America's people, fix the middle class, rebuild the middle class, save the middle class, transform its economic situation. So let me tell you the research I did and the results I found. First, I made use of research done by the Tax Policy Center, a nonpartisan, very good, very well qualified research outfit. And they sat down and did a study of how each level of household in America would be affected by the tax cut. Let me give you just a small flavor of what they said. If you earn less than $25,000 a year, so you are among the poorer folks in America, the tax cut will save you, get ready, because it's really going to change your life. If you earn less than $25,000, the tax cut will save you $60. That's right, you heard me, $60. If you earn between $25,000 and $49,000 a year, it will save you $360. If you earn between $49,000 and $86,000 a year, it will save you $930. That's most Americans right there. So most Americans are going to save between $60 and $900. I understand $900 is a significant amount of money for a lot of people. It's not going to transform your life. It's what you save in the entire year, not per week, not per month. That's what you save across 2018 by virtue of that fact. Now, if you are a millionaire, if you earn uh, over, I'll use this number because you might find it interesting. If you earn over $3.4 million a year, here's how much you will save by the tax cut in 2018. Ready? Here we go. 
$193,380. Let me do that again. If you earn over $3.4 million, you will save nearly $200,000 on your tax. That's a lot of money. In order to save a lot of money, you already have to have a lot of money. That's how this system always works. Nothing new has happened in this tax cut. For the vast majority of Americans, what you save in taxes will not fundamentally change your situation at all. This wasn't a tax cut for you. But it was a tax cut for the really rich. They will now have an extra $200,000. Not you. It was not a tax cut for you. It was a tax cut at your expense because you have to remember that when they cut all those taxes that don't have to be paid, particularly not by rich people, the next step is to say the government, not getting all that money from people, will not be able to fund a whole lot of programs for school kids, for road maintenance, for college educations. We're going to have a season of cutting because there isn't enough money because they cut taxes above all on the rich. So you're going to not get the benefit of the tax cut, but you are likely going to pay the cost of the tax cut, which is in a reduction in the quality and the quantity of public services in the United States, which middle and lower income people rely on more than the folks at the top. You want a tax cut for the middle class? Then give it to the middle class. We don't do that in America. We say we do it, but we don't do it. In case you're wondering, we have actually a case study that proves all this. Back in 2012, a person like Trump, a man named Sam Brownback, became the governor of Kansas. And he did in Kansas what Mr. Trump has now done. He cut taxes on the rich, and he cut taxes on corporations, promising it would really explode the economy of Kansas. It didn't do anything of the sort. Kansas went downward. Its unemployment got worse than the rest of the America in a way it hadn't before. There was no explosion of jobs, none of it. So bad is it that in the last session of the Kansas legislature, they put back in the very taxes that they had cut out under Mr. Brownback, and he was dispatched off as an ambassador to some place abroad. I can't remember the name of the country. He's gone, gone from Kansas, gone from the United States. A disaster. Because it didn't work in Kansas, it's of course logical that the same kind of politicians will now do it in the country as a whole. Next update. Many of you have no doubt watched with horror the public trial of a doctor who uh, worked on Olympic athletes in the United States, particularly young women, who was also for a long time a professor of uh, medical sciences at Michigan State University. Uh, he has been sentenced to spend the rest of his life in jail. He has had to listen to uh, 150 or maybe more uh, young women testify as to what he did to them over 20 or 30 years of being the official doctor for the USA Gymnastics that organizes our Olympic competitors, and likewise his activities at Michigan State. In recent weeks, the president of Michigan State University, other officials there, and likewise the entire board of USA Gymnastics quit. And they quit because of a rising chorus of anger and bitterness, not just from the women who suffered the sexual abuse, the sexual assaults over all those years, not even from the, just from their families, their friends, their communities, but from the general public. And I want to say to you a word about that because there's an economic lesson in all of this. Here's the lesson. If you organize a teaching institution, a university, 
such as Michigan State, a good, big state university. If you organize it as a school, it behaves in one way. If you organize it as a business, it behaves in a different way. A business depends on customers. It is afraid to reveal any of its shortcomings to its customers lest they go someplace else. It's afraid to admit to its shareholders or those who control it that it did bad things for fear they will invest somewhere else. Businesses tend to hide the illegal, the immoral that they do because it's in their interest to do that. The behavior of the people who run Michigan State University is the behavior of people in a business. It turns out that the police department of Michigan State University received something on the order of 100 complaints from young athletes at the university about this same Dr. Nasser. Some of them were pursued, some of them weren't. Nothing ever happened. The administration failed to take the most minimal protections. How in the world did you not have a major investigation after a hundred complaints? What is, the, what is the possibility that you didn't know? That's not serious. That you didn't care? I'm not willing to assume that about these people. I don't think they're monsters. But they are caught up in a system that rewards them for keeping it quiet, for hushing it up, for not letting anyone know. And when you do that, you don't expose the problem and you don't solve the problem. You subordinate the solving of the problem to the keeping up of your income, your money, your profits. Long ago, we made major universities into businesses that sell sports, that sell events, that sell all kinds of things. They even sell positions in their schools. That's not healthy. And one of the prices you pay when you mix business with education is you get business-type results, hiding, dissimulating, making money, even at the expense of the most basic kinds of human care for one another. Michigan State stands exposed, but these problems are not unique to Michigan State. They affect the entire universe of higher education and other institutions. Being businesslike has always been a very mixed bag. We've come to the end of Economic Update's first half hour. Please stay with us. I think you'll find the second half hour today as interesting, if not more. <laughs>